fill the void. An unfamiliar path also its own. Three, two, one. Final encounter cast. Interesting conflicts, not conflicts of interest. Typical corporate bullshit. With your hosts, Nate, Robbie, Chris, Nika, and Kelly. Final Encounter Cast.com. Ready, ready? Get set? Go! Hey, what's up? Welcome to Final Encounter Cast. Final Encounter Cast.com. Thanks for joining us at our new time, starting at 1 p.m. here at twitch.tv slash Limit Break Radio. Appreciate all 114 of you joining us right here at the top of the program. Ooh, nice. Uh, again, FinalEncounterCast.com. Line your calls up. Final Encountercast on Skype, 810-207-1764. We're going to be continuing our conversation from last week about uh, the PewDiePie drama kerfuffle. I don't know what the hell to call this fucking thing anymore. But, uh, you know, last week I basically got to get up here on my soapbox and tell you how how I felt about it, and uh, joining us this week, well, uh, Nika is back. Hi, Nika. Welcome back. Hi, thanks. Oh, was she gone? Did you enjoy your mandatory timeout for conducting a civil conversation on our other show? What? That's what we told people what happened. Yeah. That's what happened. Don't you dare tell them anything different. You weren't allowed on the show last yeah. week. I didn't, I didn't want to be on the show last week because of all you assholes. Well, good. Oh, oh, okay, good. Well, we didn't want you here, yeah. so... <laughs> Children behave. Uh, anyway, welcome back. Thanks. How, how, how was how was your convention? It was awesome. Yeah, actually, yeah. like a lot, a lot of fun. Which one were you at? Katsukon. Oh, okay. How was giving birth to your baby? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. I have a baby every time I'm gone. Right. That's right. She has yeah. two now. Any any yes. Anytime Nika's not here, that's clearly what is happening. I'm in I'm in labor every time I'm not here. Also joining us, we've got Norris. Uh, uh, is this your first time on Final Encounter Cast? I know you've been on Limit Break Radio, but yeah. is it? All right, cool. Well, yeah, yeah, welcome yeah. to Final Encounter Cast. What's up? What's up? Norris is... Uh, Joe plus one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's like Joe, but better. Uh, <laughs> so he's just one? Oh, that's me. <laughs> um, but uh, no, uh, Norris uh, uh, hosts over on Checkpoint. Uh, Joe's not able... Or, uh, Callie is not able to join. He's got so many goddamn <laughs> names i can't right, i can't you. even keep track anymore but <laughs> uh yeah Callie's not uh, able to join us this week he's uh he's recovering from uh, being sick from a couple of different oh, things gosh, i don't even right? know yeah he's gone through a bunch of tests he also has to deal with the fact that he can never AIDS. have aids <laughs> I no, I don't. He think... He can have AIDS. That would no. That let's, was let's me. That was me who was getting right. the yeah, AIDS but, test. And then you gave him the AIDS. No, I don't think I. I don't. Anyway, he can't drink alcohol. I don't anymore. think. Can you give someone some? A dis, uh, yeah, can you give someone AIDS that you don't have? Is that possible? Yes, AIDS is very no. weaponized. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Bio weapon. Anyway, uh, Norris, thanks for joining us this week. We appreciate AIDS. it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, now, I was, I, I now was aware just, you guys needed me yeah, this week. Yeah, we 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 shine the Norris signal. <laughs> Need is a strong word. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I I've I listened to, for a couple weeks straight. It's it's pretty necessary. But we're going to be talking about PewDiePie again this week and uh, of course we want to take your calls on uh, on the situation 8102071764 final encounter cast on Skype. Get them ready as we sit here and uh, talk about the latest in the news. I'm here <clears throat> to do the news tonight. And that's the way the news goes. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you important news. Here's a story that's out of this world. All right, here we go. So since Joe's gone, I get to do the news again. And in Saudi Arabia, the first ever Comic-Con was held, attracting Whoa. people from all across the country to the coastal city of Jeddah. A massive tent was set up hosting guests like Mads Mikkelsen from Doctor Strange, Giancarlo Esposito of Breaking Bad, and Charles Dance from Game of Thrones. The event is going to become annual, and this year was said to be a soft test with a much larger event next year. I mean, I think that's a pretty big deal. That is a yeah, big that's deal. Cool. I like more, it. The, the uh, more Comic Cons we can get going all over the place, heck yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that 
especially in a in a country like Saudi Arabia, having the culture, you know, the the nerd culture, the geek culture, comic culture, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, have it being embraced is, uh, I think, pretty pretty cool. Very substantial. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Bethesda's Todd Howard offered an update on the current developmental state of the company, saying that there are five major products being worked on. Elder Scrolls 6 is, of course, in development, but it's a long ways off. And Fallout 4 for, for VR is currently playable start to finish. He emphasized, though, that no content in Fallout 4 will be unavailable on the VR. That's pretty huge. That's a lot of content. That is a lot of content, but, I mean, it doesn't seem like... I don't know. It doesn't seem like all that much that much work. Like, I mean, they're saying that they have, what? Uh, they said they had... Uh, uh, five, five major projects, yep, yep. and then the other ones is you obviously have Skyrim for the Switch, and then two large scale original projects. I I really hope one of them is is Elder Scrolls Six. Well, yeah, they said one of them just is said in that. Development. Oh, it's okay. far away, <laughs> but it's still a long okay. ways off. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, the Dice Quake tournament nearly gave us a fun showdown between the directors of Overwatch and quote unquote rival Battleborn. But in step, ID. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> can you keep that in? Yeah, that was ridiculous. <laughs> but in step, ID software director uh, Tim Willits, uh, who knocked out Kaplan in the semifinals, he then went on to win the tournament overall. Uh, Overwatch did, however, take Game of the Year at the Dice Awards, edging out games like Battlefield One and Pokemon Go. They swept up a slew of other rewards at or awards at the event. And a special shout out to Dark Souls Three, who took best RPG. You know, I'm gonna say that that was probably well deserved. Overwatch has been just a fucking juggernaut. Steam rolling everything. It is. It is. I mean, there's almost no one who doesn't play it. I feel really like left out because I didn't uh, jump right on it. It's not hard to get it's into. Not hard. I, I know it's not. It's just I don't, dude. I don't even have time to play the games that's that fair. I really no, want to play, that's, that's much fair. less get into something. But that's new. part of what makes it good. You yeah. don't have to spend five hours playing Overwatch. Some of my favorite yet saddest memes that you see is when you get like that really hardcore Battleborn fan that wants <laughs> to make a meme to try to show Battleborn supremacy over Overwatch and just like, oh, honey. oh, stop. <laughs> I mean, is there? I, I can't. I, no one's playing Battleborn is I've never even heard of Battleborn that's, <laughs> you, that's, that's, that's the, the point only, the only the only way the only way you've heard of Battleborn is I don't know like if you saw the YouTube ads yeah and you know what the only thing that Battleborn is like doing right now is holding us back from the next Borderlands because Gearbox has said after Battleborn the next project they're going to work on is uh Borderlands 3 so can people just stop playing Battleborn altogether? Let it die. I want to get the next Borderlands it, games. It, I mean that it's pretty sad that that Gearbox just released such a such a clearly inferior product. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Gearbox Gearbox has had good track record. They, Borderlands they has been good. Yeah. I don't even know that Battleborn's bad. It just came out the wrong time. It really did because yeah. it, yeah. it it inevitably get, got compared to Overwatch every single time yep. anyone brought sure it up. Did. Yeah. Uh, with a little fanfare, Nintendo opened up their new user account ID system this week, so if you want to <sighs> secure your online ID for the Switch, you should head over and put your claim in at the Nintendo account site. So, uh, Nintendo guy Chris, have you done this yet? No. Why not? You're the Nintendo guy. Aren't you? Aren't you? Aren't you concerned that someone is going to secure the name Juxtaposition, or Chewy, or Fat? <laughs> <laughs> you guys. I mean, I, I would think that Fat would be a, a one that's like probably e not available. I, I mean, yeah, it's probably taken already, so your choices are limited. Yeah, now you have to be like Fat 2005 or Nose for Fat too. That was, I was a thing. Nose for Fat too. I yeah. think that one is probably safe mm -hmm. though. Yeah. You should. I, I think you should go register right now on the show and let us know what name you pick. As Nos for Fatu. Yeah. No. Why? Because I hate that name. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, you do? Yeah, it's way too clever for you to come up with. <laughs> Pretty sure I came up with that one. No, that, that's I, fair. I came up with that one. Don't you? I really I appreciate the thought you put into. I it, bet Robbie. someone in the chat said it, and one of us stole it. <laughs> no, let's be honest. No, that was that was definitely mine. Okay, well, you know what? Then because I stumbled on 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 getting it out. That's how I knew. If 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 a joke has been stepped on, stumbled over, mush mouthed, or mumbled, it's definitely from me. That's fair. In fact, I think you deserve a reward, which is why I made sure this next news story got on the outline. So this one's for you, Nate. 
Kotaku has done a biographical piece on one of the oldest living MMOs, Furcadia. Launched in 1996, the game peaked at around 75,000 users and is now down to 15,000. The remaining development team, mostly volunteer, is now working to modernize the game. Uh, somehow we don't see um, this realm being Volunteer reborn. development team? <laughs> Almost. There's, there's at least one guy who's probably there against his will, and it's only because he's being paid. But it's a furry <laughs> MMO. D you said... It's Wait, so the furry MMO is the longest-running MMO? You said... One of the oldest. Uh, okay. It's called... Furcadia. Furcadia. That's awesome. <laughs> That's an Shut awesome up. name. Shut up. <laughs> well, I mean, That's so next gen. It's clever. Nika, stop talking. <laughs> oh, clever. oh. Let Nate gi digest this. <laughs> it's the oldest running MMO. <laughs> One of the oldest, yep. When did it start? Do you have any idea? 1996. 1996. Wow. Is wow, it like that Second has been, Life or That's something? impressive. And it's still running with 15,000 players? Holy yeah. crap. Does that predate? What's, uh, does what's that... Ultima Online? When, when did that one pop up? Oh, that was uh, a long, long, long time ago. That's yeah. That's a really good question. Um, I actually don't know. Uh, fat, look it up. <laughs> what? What? When did what? Ultima, Ultima Online. Online. And well, uh, I have to wonder if it predates. Does it predate Neopets? Because that was the first like. But does Neopets count as an MMO? Yeah, it Ultima, doesn't. I well, don't think it, it does count as an MMO. It's but, a most. It's a massive multiplayer online game. Right. It's not RPG. But yeah. yeah. No, but I. But I think that that's one of the things that. Nineteen ninety-seven. Nine Ultima Online. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It so predates wow. Ultima Online? The furries were in there before any of us. Oh, my God. <laughs> How spine-chillingly creepy is that? <laughs> it's pretty creepy. Oh. That, that might give me nightmares now. Oh, the graphics yeah. aren't so bad. Uh, the, the, you know, there's actually also a... Uh, it, it popped up on my stupid list for uh, recent additions to Netflix, but there is actually a furry documentary on Netflix called Fursonas. The real question no. is why? Yes. No, 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 no. The question no. is why is that popping up in your suggested? No, not YouTube? suggested. <laughs> not yeah. suggested. Furry suspicion. Not suggested. You Norris, fucking, you, you can't can, change nope. the story. <laughs> you <laughs> fucking Fergit. No. You're under furry suspicion. Recently added and suggested are two separate nope. entities. Recently added. Recently added. Those, those, uh, Recently uh, added. The you added it to your Netflix. Nope. No, you're furry. Fuck you. The you're furry. algorithms. The algorithms. Algorithms definitely will populate all that's, of your no, that's all ridiculous. of your categories. Because I have never watched an anime on Netflix before, and it oh, puts really? anime. I, I feel like anything with anime would rep, would. And bring it up puts the animes stuff. on my recently added all the you time. You fox-eared asshole! You've never watched an anime on Netflix ever. No, because fuck animes. So, uh -huh. uh, Robbie, off topic, but how's your uh, Sly Cooper cosplay going? <laughs> I haven't started a Sly Cooper cosplay. But, oh, but you do want to. But thanks, fat. Uh, so, so wait, a so you've you've never like even at the behest of a girl watched an anime on Netflix? Not on Netflix. Uh, no, I don't believe you. You don't have to believe. Where do you watch I them? Amazon? Crutchy? I don't watch animes. He he watches. <laughs> How do you not he watches, watch anime? He watches them. He watches them uh, in in uh, uh, Chrome with the private browsing <laughs> turned on on his phone incognito in the, in the bathroom. I also learned that I'm secretly a furry. <laughs> <laughs> things Moving we on. Things we learned about Robbie today. <laughs> Studio is Tolia, a newly formed developer under the Square Enix group, is developing an all-new original RPG titled Project <coughs> Prelude Rune. The head of the new studio is Hideo Baba, who was the long-serving director on the Tales of series. Now, this is something that I kind of wanted to be a little bit excited about, but of course, Nate was quick to point out, well, look what happened to all their other newest RPGs. I am Setsuna. Bravely second, I am Setsuna. What was that last, whatever, last remnant? Uh, last, yes! Oh, la that was oh, shit. Oh my I, I god, was that bad. That made me so mad because I started playing it, and the story was actually okay at a certain point, but the battle system was horrendous, and then as soon terrible. as something... And like the worst thing is like okay we're gonna make it really sad when a character dies and then replace that character with an exact copy of that wait, character. wait wait that There's, was the joint like, with the four-armed uh, cat dude right 
There was a four-armed uh, cat dude in the last room. Maybe. Bit. There might have been. Wow. The Chris looks where, really like, excited when you, you mention a four-armed cat dude. You form <laughs> teams arms? and units with your battle system, and you yeah. can't actually control the characters individually. You control them as a unit, and they just kind of do whatever they want most of the time. Oh, that it's sounds really, terrible. It's, there's, really, it's there, really bad. There's a moment. There's a moment. I rage quit that game. There's a moment in last remnant that it wasn't even like a fight or anything like that it was a moment in a cutscene that made me bail hard like i couldn't get the disc out of the machine fast enough <laughs> and i just i was like this is the worst game ever made Do you remember the moment i remember that there was some kid there was a kid like a kid npc and he like like prances away and then your main character does the exact same thing <laughs> like mirrors him and i just went no no and i, I like the, i i almost broke the xbox ripping that disc out of the machine it was it was w way like far and away so much worse than like the titus laugh or like any of the kid, like associated kid moments of of uh uh um lost odyssey I, just like it was it may have been the most cringy moment i've ever seen wow. in video games more ever. than the ending of that. like drakengard with the babies with the fully formed teeth i don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that moment. Just look that's up the not, ending of Drakengard. Well, that's not a moment that I know. You really don't want to. Anyway, going back, <laughs> going back to the story. Going back to the story. Uh, it, it, it's also the director of the Tales of series, which, which I've never been a fan of. But it does uh, well. But the Tales right? games are pretty well. Okay, well, okay. About half of them are really good. Half when of them are Nika really good. goes, when Nika goes, well, okay, you know, uh, yeah, I guess that, that this is going to be bad. Like, Tales of Berseria is fantastic, but there's a lot of Tales games because Tales has the Assassin's Creed syndrome where they have to pump out one every single year, well, and so sometimes they're hits and sometimes they're major misses. I'm but a, they're super anime. Yeah, like, that's anime the, only, that's, that's why they're the bad. only thing I know about them is that they're like the most anime thing ever. Well, the the fact that this new studio is developing it and it's, oh, I guess, I don't know if it's it'll be if it'll be. Considered considered Square Enix developed or just produced, but I'm going to try to remain optimistic about it. Wow. Uh, that's Nintendo. That's a lonely island, sir. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Nintendo has been looking for some celebrity help to promote the Switch, and now they found someone, and his name is... John C. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. The 16-time world champion took part in an event this week promoting the Switch, playing games with YouTube personalities and other celebrities. Dude, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Do you ever think that we would legitimately use a John Cena joke on this show? <laughs> no, no. Now we have reason yeah. to have that drop mm -hmm. on the board. That's Hooray! Yeah. Chuck, or Chris and I have been waiting forever for this moment. Um, Happy birthday! It's not your birthday. <laughs> it is today. <laughs> um, so uh, I realized something, and uh, I mean, because like for the last two weeks, we've for this show, also for Checkpoint, we've kind of been hurting a little bit for stuff to talk about, for mm -hmm. news that's mm -hmm. been going on. And I just realized it's because the Switch comes out in, like, like a couple of weeks. Like, it's really close to coming out. I think it's less than a couple of weeks, isn't it? It's the March, beginning of March? It's March 3rd. March 3rd. Oh, yeah, so that's, like, two weeks. Yeah, that's, like, around the corner. It's, dude, it's not two weeks. It's this Friday. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Right. So <laughs> while y'all are playing with your little Switches, I'm going to just be seeing Logan. So I mean, yeah, I won't be getting a switch either. Yeah, but no one's Got gonna my pre-order. No one is gonna try to go up against Nintendo. Like for <laughs> who would release and like would do that to exactly. begin with? Exactly. Like you, you've got a couple of you know, you've got these next couple of weeks. No one's gonna do anything in the next couple of weeks. You've got the switch basically that's gonna rule for the two weeks after mm -hmm. that. Oh, that's at, being generous. At, and then Mass Effect. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah, so, right. I mean, so out of all of us, uh, Nick is the only one who who got the Switch pre-order. And the thing is, is I didn't actually have one. My friend had one, and she was giving it up, and so I took it from her. Oh well, I guess Nika. Oh <laughs> man, God damn! That's We're actually gonna have to rely on Nika to be a source of information on Nintendo. I'm uh, really just gonna play Zelda, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I won't know anything about any of the other games. Yeah, well, you have to. There's there's other games. No. Oh, that, that's news to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> one two Switch, duh. <laughs> Did Nika just make a joke? No, I think... Yeah. <laughs> okay, she tried to make a joke. That's fair. Ugh. 
Speaking of Nintendo, we're sad to report the passing of Alan Stone, one of the co-founders of Nintendo of America. He worked both for Nintendo and Sega and helped popularize titles like Donkey Kong and Mario in America. Uh, I just want to point out that I did not see the outpouring of sympathy on Facebook like when <laughs> Awada died. Well, which Awada just, was like it just pr- no, bigger. it proves my point how empty and worthless fucking death tributes on social media are. Nobody bothered to talk about this guy because nobody gave a shit. So don't sit there and pretend it's like oh well he gave well this guy was equally responsible of giving us years and years of entertainment. But nobody really gave a fuck. Speaking of, Bill Paxton died today. He did. Yeah, he did. Aww. Yeah. Browser-based kids game Club Penguin is only a month away from being shut down for good. But people have found a use for it anyhow. A nude speed running. A nude? Nude? <laughs> a nude, nude speed running? Nude, nude speed game? running. What? All right. A new speed running now, competition. Now, as soon as we talk about penguins, you talk about nude. Furry. <laughs> Oh. oh, I hate you so much. Even more suspicious. And Norris what? needs to be on this show a little bit more often. Mm-hmm. He's putting things together on a level that I don't think any of us are. Anyway, oh, the point of this speed running competition is that people go and create a new account and they time how long it takes them to get it banned. As of this article, <laughs> the record is thirty nine point five three seconds. I love this. I think this is. I mean, hysterical. the game's going down anyway. Who cares, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, a a speedrunning competition of how quickly you can get banned. That's actually pretty good too. Under forty seconds, it's nice. That's. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wonder what. I wonder what you got to do. What do you do? Like the, the admin is even paying that close attention to you. Forty you seconds just, after you start. You just go in and start spamming as many obscenities yeah. as you possibly can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess. Read one of our fanfics, maybe. Yeah, there you go. People are copy and pasting our fanfics. But I feel bad for the legitimate children who are still playing it, who are like, what the hell are people spamming swear there, words? What yeah. children are playing that game? There child. are no children Nika, playing that game. Yeah, Nika, there are no... Uh, kids moved on from Club Penguin to Minecraft fucking 10 years um, ago. No, I mean, when I worked at GameStop, like, back in 2012, there were still people coming and buying Club Penguin cards. So 2012 is how five, long five, ago? That's five years ago, Nika? not ten. How long? That's five. half a decade. That's half a decade. That's long enough to people to stop caring about something. That's one quarter of a generation, Nico. Okay, well, he said 10 years ago. I just proved him wrong. That's all. <laughs> that, that's all she cares about is she technically that's, proved you wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. what I was trying mm-hmm. to do. Nika's not right. Norris is just wrong. You can have that one. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. Ah, crud. What What did you do? I pressed a button. I mean, come on. You look everything. ridiculous. <laughs> Seriously. We're sitting here waiting for you to can, move with the lawn. Can we switch Robbie out for Callie next time? And just a League North of Legends yes. fan channel titled League Highlights got hit with a run of DMCA takedowns. This is strange as Riot Games typically doesn't ever issue such takedowns over League. Well, it turns out the user was posting videos of defending world champion SKT1's pro streams and the takedown notices came from SKT1 themselves. That's interesting. Because, I mean... I guess, you know, like, if someone took our videos and started to perpetuate them on a different channel, I think that would definitely, like, we would do something similar, you know what I mean? Would we? I mean, it's I mean, technically, like, free advertising. Mm, like nah, because they're taking it depends all the on what they're, Yeah, it depends on what they're doing with it. All the like ad money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the zero ad money that we don't monetize on, on YouTube. But, I mean, like, if that was, I mean, if that was your... You know, like if you were getting some serious money out of that, then I think that you I would suppose, want to defend yeah. that. I guess it depends on how many views that channel was getting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I mean, content content stealing is a big deal. Oh, like, absolutely. It happens sure, a lot. Sure. And, dude, people, uh, especially, you know, like working in, in radio, uh, I, you know, I, I and managing social media, I see this a lot firsthand, is that there are lawyers out there who, I mean, I'll, I describe them like, they're like ambulance chasers on the mm-hmm. internet, except they're looking for minor infractions uh, from big organizations who have money, or who they think have money. That would rather just pay a little sum compared to what they already have. That's made. right, yeah, yeah. They'd, they'd rather just go ahead and take care of it, rather than, you know, um, uh, license 
sends the stuff out. But I mean, like some of these lawsuits are in the, you know, uh, you know, 70, 80, sometimes hundred thousand dollars. Some it's it's ridiculous, especially when you get images involved that are licensed by places like Image Shack or Getty. I mean, it can get really, really complicated and really, really frustrating. Um, you can't just take somebody's content. You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you, you can share content. You can redirect. You can make content your own, but you can't just take it as your own. You can't just claim it as your own. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that. Like, I get that. So yeah. following up on a story from last week, the package containing ten thousand dollars worth of SNES games has been located. And no, oh. it wasn't by a guy dressed up as Batman. It was found at perhaps the last moment possible in an Atlanta recovery center errantly shipped mail's last destination before going up to auction. Bayou had posted a uh, PayPal donation request to help pay for the lost games, and all of that money has now been refunded. He has since declared that the archive project is undead and has taken a valuable lesson on the virtue of shipping in smaller amounts and getting insurance. So, Good. Well, no shit, Sherlock. Yeah, so I guess that, that almost sad story turned out to be not so sad. It's funny, I think we reported on that on Checkpoint. I don't think we even talked about that on Final Encounter. No, we, we talked about that. Yeah, we did. did we? we did. Oh, okay, we did. Right. We did. Yeah. I, we, I'm, we're producing too many goddamn gaming Tell shows. Tell me about it. <laughs> it's so hard to keep this shit straight we'll, now. We'll talk about stuff after Checkpoint that I'm like, all right, I should mention Do that stuff to job. Chris. And then I won't because I'm like, he was there, wasn't he? Oh, no, that was Checkpoint, yeah. Ubisoft's For Honor has received great reviews and looks to be a solid game, but all is not perfect. Their anti-cheat software has been banning innocent players, and though a hotfix was issued earlier in the week, some problems with it do persist. Currently, Ubisoft recommends against using an expat or controller, which can register multiple attacks onto one button and may be triggering the auto ban. So this isn't even necessarily a matter, because remember, uh, Battlefield 1 had a similar problem, where people that were so good yeah. were actually, they're like, oh, you're botting because you actually can't be that great in right. banning. It's just registering multiple button presses? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, I I, I mean... No, nah, in For Honor, that makes perfect sense, though. Because, like, unlike Battlefield, where that's super egregious, just because somebody's good, they shouldn't be flagged as a right, bot. Right, right. But in For Honor, being able to achieve multiple button presses in that game is kind of unfair as hell. So... I can understand it. Yeah, the hot fix is good, but I can understand why the bot would just be like, nope, mm-mm, mm-mm, nope, and just auto ban. Ugh, auto ban as opposed to like like having like a maybe a, maybe a strike system though. I mean, a strike system, in my opinion, is just better for almost any game. Yeah, honestly. Mm -hmm. But do do faster button press. I mean, I haven't played For Honor yet. I'm definitely going to pick it up uh, probably tonight. But uh, do faster button presses really have a big impact? Yeah. Because I thought I, I, I mean the it, same one though. No. See, is it is it just of the same one, or is it like multiple different button presses? Because there are certain classes that you can do kind of like it one frame cancels and stuff like that. It can register multiple attacks onto what? Oh, I see what it's saying. Like you could actually probably map out a combo by pressing one see, button. See, there you go. Oh, okay. there you go. All right, so yeah. this this isn't gonna this isn't gonna be like oh you pressed X twice I'm gonna ban you. You probably actually have to go out of your way to right. register. So you know what? No, those people can get fucked. Yeah. <laughs> It's another celebration in Pokemon. Wow, he did a quick 180 on that. <laughs> Holy yeah, shit. Okay. Then I guess just pout. God damn, dude. It's, a, uh, it's another celebration in Pokemon Go, which means another Pikachu wearing a festive hat. Celebrating Pokemon Day, which falls on February 27th, a special event will be going on from the 26th to the 6th in which you can catch a Pikachu wearing a party hat. In cool. addition, we can now confirm two new regional Pokemon in Gen 2. Heracross is the South American region's Pokemon, and Corsola spawns around the equator. Damn. I saw a goddamn Heracross in a gym the other day. I, I, I assume they can still be hatched, right? Was that ever confirmed? No, 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 yeah. no in the Gen ones, you can only have them in the specific region. Ugh, you can catch them. That's terrible. Yep, yep. Uh, so that it, that means that there is probably someone who is GPS spoofing. Okay, already. so now you're telling me that there are certain uh, regions that have two region specifics, Corsola yep. and whatever they have. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of cool, though, is that, yeah. I mean, like... Except we're never going to get, like, another region like that unless it's like, this Pokemon only spawns around the Great Lakes? No, they, they have North America. Tauros is only North America. Right, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying, like, there are some regions that also fall on the equator as well as having their own regional Pokemon. Th that's true. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I do think it's cool, though, that they didn't go back and, like, find regional exclusive Pokemon now for Gen 2 in... Each other regions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we would have Tauros and something else? Exactly, yeah, right. Because I mean, yeah, a lot of fair. people thought that we would get Tauros and Miltank, mm-hmm. that Miltank would be North American exclusive. And I like that as the game grows, the exclusive Pokemon grow. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a cool concept. And so, just, like, They just need to add trading, though. <laughs> They really do. Well, it's Mm-mm. it's funny because uh, 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 if they do, we don't think it's going to be like a GTS trading. It, we think it's going to be like yeah. proximity trading. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're just going to automatically the day of trading be able to. Oh get yeah, all yeah, of, of course. But right. like, I have friends who have been spending time in Japan who are going to come back and give Farfetch to everybody. But the thing is, is they have to actually put that in. Um, well, and uh, I mean, because we, we, we did talk about this on Checkpoint. This we did talk yeah, about. Yeah, we did. Checkpoint. We did check talk about this on Checkpoint. But um, it, it, Kelly had brought up that he thinks that it, it, trading would be bad. Like it would, it, it would take away the collecting aspect if of done Pokemon in a GTS Go. type way. I, I and I, I you know we had brought I had brought up yeah that um you know GTS would probably be a bad way to do it and that there would have to be some built-in restrictions. Mm-hmm. But the more I thought about it like I actually think that they're going to need to at least get one more generation in to make that first generation of Pokemon <laughs> that much more rare in order to be able to pull off trading yes. in a satisfying way yeah. cuz right now I think I think that that is kind of a legitimate concern is that you could just trade to fill your decks and then you know right. check, uh, check out again because they when they add more and more pokemon it's going to inherently make the other pokemon especially from generation one even more rare i mean i haven't seen a starter except for a war turtle since i came back from the original generation but they have they have found ways to sort of balance that with in the special new, with events like, well not just the special events but like the new egg chart with uh some of the harder to hatch you know the the 10K is being moved down oh, to the 5K. Oh, you know what? Ks. Fuck Cali. I hatched an Omanite today out of a 10K. Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Damn. So fuck you, Cali. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe that was a 10K that he hatched. I think it probably fucking was. <laughs> and he's just an idiot. But there have been some 10Ks that were legitimately moved down to 5Ks. And a lot of 5Ks have moved down to the 2Ks also. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. But no, as we get further along, everything's just going to become more rare. It's just the way that it's going to be. And adding and trading will help to, I think, rejuvenate uh, another part of the social aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. But I think that we also, I'm, I, again, we got to see the legendary events. We oh, got. I yeah, know. I can't believe we've getting, we're getting Gen 2 and still don't have a single legendary. Uh, yeah, this is ridiculous. Like, we got Ditto, but that just wasn't even counted because it, now these and they didn't in. even do any type of special event. It's just like, all right, Dillo's available now. Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, look, he came out alongside the extra candy event or something, but... Look, Niantic needs to prove the concept that they... Uh, whatever they have for legendaries, they need to, like, come out with it and be like, this is what we're doing for legendaries, yeah. and at least do the first one. Do Mewtwo. Do, you know, one oh, of the... No, not just, Mewtwo out no of the not Mewtwo, on. man. No. Then, then do, like, You would do Mewtwo the birds. The you would do the bir- legendary birds. Well, I don't if know, you man. Wanna, no, you wanna, if you're not getting Mewtwo, you're definitely not getting Mew. Are if, you stupid? If you want to prove a definitely concept, not you can start with just one. Yeah. But, but in, in that case, it would have to be Mew or Mewtwo. No, it wouldn't. You're gonna do just one bird? No, just do all three. But... But th- I think that's a different concept. Yes. Because, uh, look, y- y- there's going to be a different driving concept between a trio, mm-hmm. like, you know, the... The, the do- birds or the dogs. The dog- yeah, the birds, the dogs, the lake trio. That's going to be one... Con- I think that's going to be one event concept mm-hmm. that I think if the APK mining that has been done is accurate, that that's going to end up being some kind of sponsored event. Whereas a one-off like Mewtwo or Mew would be entirely different. Mm-hmm. And we need to see that large-scale event. An actual event. No, you'd, yeah. see, you'd see something like Lugia before you saw Mew or Mewtwo. Point blank, period. They're too they're too important to the to the whole franchise. They're they're iconic Pokemon in the franchise. There's no I feel way like Lugia is too though, because Lugia yeah. is a whole movie. More than Mew it. or Mewtwo? Are you serious? Mewtwo is in Smash Brothers. And Mewtwo has his own movie. You know, Lugia, about so, him. so does I'm Lugia, calling it yeah. right Lugia's now. movie with all the other birds. I'm calling it right now, those releases when they do Mew, Mewtwo, Lugia, whatever, it's just gonna be like go to a sprint, go to a GameStop. 
It's going to be something super lame like that. Wasn't there something in the files back in the day about a McDonald's and yeah. that never happened? It's going to be go to Boost Mobile and buy a $300 phone and it has a chance to spawn. <laughs> <laughs> Pay to win. Oh, my God. Yeah, you buy a $300 phone, install Pokemon Go, and when you open it, there's a chance it could have Articuno on it. <laughs> the, the, Fuck so, Articuno. Look, they need to do something. They do. No, they, I absolutely they, agree. they need to honestly do something. Because with I don't every, know what it is. With but. every gen that comes out, the legendaries mythics grow exponentially. There was yeah. well, it was like gen three or four that had like twelve. Yeah. yeah. It was insane. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh. they need to figure out something with those. See, gen they're gonna release one legendary every year on Pokemon Go's anniversary. Get out. That's what's going to happen. Which generation was celebrating? Mm. It needs to hang on. It needs to be mentioned that that this this festive Pikachu event is connected to the twenty first or the twenty sixth. It's connected to Pokemon, Pokemon Day. Day. Oh, not it's Pokemon, Pokemon Day. Not oh, Pokemon okay. Go Day. Oh, okay. Yeah, Pokemon Go. Because uh, if, if you actually if you play it on the day that it was released here, then if you go to your uh, to your little where you can look at like your stats and stuff like that, it tells you when you created your account. So that's essentially. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and that was uh, what June or July. July. Yeah. July. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. According to sources, GameStop will be changing its controversial Circle of Life program next week. We win! <laughs> You're we welcome, did, Internet. We did it! Well, mm, rather than tracking individual scores, each GameStop location will have one single Circle of Life score. In addition, there'll be a fifth category for new game sales. So the new game sales thing oh, is cool. On. That's still bad for stores like mine, though. But, well, hold on. No, it says they're adding a fifth category, which is the new game. So now you don't turn people away from new games anymore. But honestly, even though they're saying that they won't be using individual scores, as management, you're still going to be responsible for keeping track of which employees are performing and which ones aren't True, performing. but even still, this, that, is that, this is superficial at best. It is, but it, it's still bad for stores like mine where I was saying that really our entire store sales were so low because we had such a high population of tourists that they would just completely turn over 100% of the staff every year because, oh, the staff can't do it. We're going to switch the staff to get their numbers well, up. But at that's least never what that's At least gonna... now you're actually getting recognition for selling, you know, all those FIFA games and stuff that's, like that. That's true, mm -hmm. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, the video game industry is lobbying against a bill currently for this along in Nebraska, which will require manufacturers to provide replacement parts and diagnostic instruction manuals to independent repair companies. The game industry currently owns a comfortable monopoly on aftermarket repair of consoles and are sending lobbyists around the country to oppose such bills. For more information on the news and other stories, visit our blog at FinalEncounterCast.com. That is so shady. So shady. Like, like the thing is, too, whenever I've had any problems with consoles, which usually isn't anything like more than the red ring of death if we remember right you send it and they fix it for free and send it back to you I'd if even, it's under warranty uh, yes yeah. if it's under warranty man i yeah. had even left a game in there like on accident and when it came back it was in like a nice little like padded little <laughs> like like you know a, a case and stuff so it didn't get like ruined or anything like that i'm like oh that's where that went but still though i mean like let's say you know you still would have to send it in and then if you're out of warranty i think it was like 120 bucks for like ps2s or something like yeah. that and if you don't have the money to do that or if you just rather fix it yourself i mean don't you think it's kind of better to have more options I as was, a consumer I, yeah i was gonna say as a consumer i feel like this isn't like is this really like that evil of a thing? Shouldn't other places be able to repair? No, I think this for I you? think Nate was saying like it's evil for like the game companies to be sending lobbyists and like you know these Bill Hatchet men to try to kill That's something fair. like That's that. That's fair. Yeah, That's because fair. I mean I think you do want third party uh, repair shops to have the ability and the expertise. They're talking about cutting off the source of information and making that all proprietary. Like you're talking about having. Uh, you know, things like screws being made to a specific tool set so that only Sony has those screws. Has, has the screwdriver ha for yes, it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, the, you know, there's no way to, yeah. it, to, to, to buy that on the open market. Actually, Sony kinda, controls that. Kind of surprised it's taken this long. I mean, I mean, what generation of consoles are we in now? And this is just now kind of starting to get traction. I mean, but it's the industry's just now getting, well, not just now, but I want to say maybe in the past 15 years, gotten to a point to where it's so large that maybe governments start to pay attention to it. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in the early 90s, I mean, you can't really say games were big enough to warrant legislation. That's fair. The, that's, look, that's the, fair. the government trying to get into that shooter's phone was uh, it's something that brought 
a story mm-hmm. like this or a subject like this to the forefront of consciousness and when you when you do that you're going to inevitably end up attracting dollars you're going to get money thrown at yeah. you and when you get money thrown at you and you can hire lobbyists like that now you are seeing the whole right to repair uh you know issue being discussed and talked about and I think that that's really weird. I don't want one place to be responsible for repairing things. Not only that, but it prevents modding and home brewing. And, you know, I'm not a huge advocate of that stuff, uh, but I think that the people who do sh- you know they shouldn't be punished that for stuff it stuff pushes yeah. the industry forward it in does. a way too so i mean to like kind of which we always thought like you know the game companies or big publishers and stuff kind of were for stuff like that like hey kind of manipulate our stuff because you know what it might have a great idea that we implement later on so that's kind of a 180 on that and then also, I mean, it would be like owning a bike and you can't take it to your local bike shop. Yeah, like yeah. you have to send mm-hmm. your Huffy back to Huffy. Yeah, you gotta mail it. You gotta, you know, you, you know, then you gotta they, wait the seven if weeks. They embraced more like that. Like they should get a hold of all these dudes that are like installing like capture cards on DSs and be like, we want to turn you into a little branch of our own. I, but, but I mean, that's that's even worse. Yeah, that's even worse because now you're taking out an entire sector of like small business owners and stuff like that well they at least need to protect them then i I mean i think that the right to repair does Mm -hmm. like that the whole concept of right to repair does um and you know i i I think that this is an important issue that people have got to pay attention to especially if you're into uh, you know modding and home uh, you know home brewing mm-hmm. uh this is going to have a big impact on on your ability to do that and if you do that the ability to trace you track you and and punish you for doing for you know, we see that a lot like the concept of hacking is not a very well looked upon thing right now like for I, oh, it's I, a scary buzzword. Yeah, it is. But I mean, like for a couple of years, it wasn't because you would see at um, you know things like makers fairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would see like you know DIY hackathons, and it was basically like kids being given like a circuit board and being taught how that circuit board works, right. or taking something that already exists and modifying it and teaching them how to modify code or modify hardware things like that and they were very simple hands-on technology demonstrations to get people and kids comfortable with using and modifying technology all of those would be technically illegal like all of that would be punishable by whoever holds that copyright Mm -hmm. and whoever created that ip and i think that that's really not good like i think that that's really bad especially like when you consider and 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 norris i love the i love the point that you brought up is that it does drive the industry take something as simple as emulation right Mm -hmm. emulation is an extension of the same thing okay and when nintendo released that throwback console that had that 30 at 30 nes games on it right yeah the, when people went in and actually looked at the ROM files that were in there, they had found that they were actual ROM files that were basically downloaded from the internet. Yeah. That was not something that came from Nintendo's internal structure. It's not like it came from their own internal archive because there is something very specific that's done to a ROM file that makes it a ROM file, that makes it able to run in an emulator. And that coding was included in all of the different game files that were on Nintendo's official system. So you can't tell me that this doesn't have some kind of circuitous cycle involved that the game publishers themselves end up seeing a benefit from. Whether it's, you know, short term engineering like that, being able to throw a bunch of games on a, you know, on a, mm-hmm. what, what is essentially a flash drive and put an HDMI port on it and put it out for, you know, less than a hundred bucks and there you go there's new hardware from nintendo but 
Or the dude who turned a N64 into a handheld. I mean, that stuff is so cool. I right. know it is. That stuff is so cool. And and I, 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 I bristle at the notion that, you know, any of that kind of stuff is is wrong or somehow infringes inherently yeah. on someone's uh, on someone's IP. If they go out and sell it, that's a kind of a different story. If they try to make significant profit off and, it, that's and a here's different the, story. And here's the funny thing: like, so look at the auto industry, for instance, right? If you would have had maybe Honda or Mitsubishi come out and lobby so hard against aftermarket manufacturers then you have a large part of their market share that probably would not have existed yeah. because people got so into the whole tuner thing at the turn of the century so in this i look at it like the manufacturers are kind of being short-sighted here because as you said you know that's going to drive some of the some of the innovation of the industry forward so if you have a bunch of people who aren't able to actually just tinker with the the consoles or repair their own consoles then you have an entire subset of, of future hardware developers or even software engineers that you're not going to have because they won't have the opportunity to do that stuff. but i think it's also you know it's also the game industry coming out and and really saying like we don't believe our customers are smart enough to be able to service their own devices or modify their own devices and we know that you know, game companies have been really, really bad about proprietary hardware. That's the th that's the reason that we're now buying consoles in three year cycles instead of ten year cycles. And when we posed the question before, I think a lot of us had had really you know liked the idea of more modular hardware, hardware yeah. where the user can swap in and out pieces as need be to be able to run better and better games and i think that this really takes the legs out from under that idea right. you're gonna i think that video game you know video game hardware makers really want you to be buying new hardware yeah. every Obviously. every yeah. every three years yeah but i don't think that that's very sustainable for them no it's not but i mean just even something as simple as how you could swap out a hard drive and put in a much larger hard drive something as simple as that in the future could become virtually impossible right. with a certain type with the type of legislation that they're supporting and that right there in my opinion, kills consoles. I mean, think about what Apple does to their products regularly. A lot of times, RAM is even soldered straight to the motherboard. Mm. I don't know if they if they've changed that practice, but there was a time mm -hmm. where they used to solder every ex you know swappable part out to their motherboards. And see, I don't know about consoles being uh, guilty of it because someone pointed out in the chat that you know uh, uh, originally consoles like a five year cycle, and the PS3 360 broke that by going. 10 years, but when you look at phones, they'll actually stop supporting certain phones with updates. I mean, I fell victim to that. I had that right. that uh, Galaxy S6 for two years, and it was worthless. You have an S5 that was upgraded further than mine was because I mm -hmm. got mine uh, unlocked from Amazon. But it's different with phones because phones are usually subsidized by mm -hmm. your service provider. So if, you know, I don't know, AT&T was subsidizing your Xbox, then you probably would get a new one every two years. Yeah, yeah. You know, because you'd only be paying 150 200 bucks for it. So that's why that can work for phones and for consoles I, I just see it as a really short-sighted and silly idea no i do too unless they start doing shorter runs of hardware which i think is also very short short-sighted uh because we see nintendo do that mm. to the point where they're accused of artificial um scarcity all the time yeah i didn't so, even know the wii u was a new generation it I, just thought, poor I just thought it was another that, upgrade to that, the Wii. That, but that's that that's, was that's different argument. That, yeah, that's that's different. Yeah. That that came down to a whole bunch of brand decisions that they should not have made. But I think we'll see this with the Switch that you know the hardware is going to hit the market. People are going to be impressed with it. A lot of people, a lot more people are going to want it than have pre-orders right now. Mm -hmm. I know I want it as soon as it becomes reasonably available, but. You're going to have a run on it, much like you've seen a run on a lot of other Nintendo products. The yeah. question is, how long is that run going to be? So unless, unless hardware makers really do start 
you know creating less product that they end up having to move at the end of at the end of the cycle you know less units that they have to move at the at the end of a of a console's life cycle then i don't really see what the benefit is to this move i don't either and and just to wrap it up i mean honestly if you have consoles with a shorter life then you actually don't have the good quality of games i think that you would have because mm -hmm. developers don't have the time to squeeze as much out of the hardware as they can so a game like uh red dead redemption that or or the last of us those games were not red dead but the last of us which was sort of kind of at the end of ps3's life cycle i mean that was a game that i honestly probably didn't really think was possible on ps3 because of the sophistication of, of some of the lighting effects and everything and the engine was fully realized and phantom pain yeah phantom pain it took a long time to get to that point right and if you're having a three-year you know life cycle on your consoles you're simply just not gonna have that quality of game anymore yeah no i i i think i agree but then again i think that the architecture is becoming a lot more unified we're seeing engines that are easily uh you know transferable between platforms like the unity engine or uh unreal and if designers if game designers are using those and trying to move off of these proprietary uh uh game development platforms like square enix has been trying mm -hmm. to do for years then i think what you'll end up seeing is ex a console exclusivity being solely driven by the business by the industry and the dick shaking and deals that go on behind the scenes yeah so so i i, I mean i don't I, I don't think that um it, you know uh, uh the the exact uh you know the the exact architecture that was used for previous generations is is necessarily applicable here i mean it, it may not be but in the same sense all it takes is for some studio to come up with a new engine or something that's really revolutionary and then everybody's going to want to use it right and so but at this point it's almost like you can take a lot of the assets that you've built and probably scale those up you know what i mean like it's not it, it, developing for a system is really you're developing for the engine and then putting the deciding which hardware to put the engine on right. which hardware to tune the engine for and it can be a dynamic process that's why we see so many games that are you know all virtually the same experience between xbox one and playstation 4. right so you know to me I think that the challenge is not necessarily on the game designers, but the onus is now on the hardware makers to figure out how to sell those units that they end up making, right? Because as a game developer, you're just developing for the uh, the 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 graphic system, the engine. Yeah, the engine. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Anyway, uh, if you want to uh, chime in on this discussion, you can give us a call, 810-207-1764. But we want to uh, revisit a topic that we talked about last week. Uh, and if you want to talk about this, we also invite your calls. Again, 810-207-1764. Final Encountercast on Skype. Seems to be... All anyone can talk about uh, is this uh, PewDiePie thing. Yeah. Uh, thang. Thang. To go back and just to, you know, if, if you missed the previous episode and just to give you some context, uh, PewDiePie had uh, done a joke on his channel. Uh, it, it Basically, he had paid two guys on uh, Fiverr, uh, Fiver, uh, two Indian gentlemen on Fiverr, uh, to unroll a sign that said death to all Jews and have somebody film them while they did it. And the joke was that PewDiePie reacted to the video as like, oh my God, I can't believe that they just did that. So uh, this prompted obviously some backlash of from his audience, but... More importantly, it caught the eye of the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. who then stepped in and w contacted Disney to get their opinion about 
what PewDiePie was doing on his channel. Well, how did they find out that he paid them in the first place? He put it on Fiverr. Yeah. Basically, when you what go to Fiverr, Fiver? Fiverr is a website where I think people, you can know, it's more, mostly for like graphics and stuff like it, that. It's actually for a variety of yeah. services. You basically mm-hmm. put up an ad. So he wanted, he put up an ad that was like, I'm going to pay whoever takes this, this much money to write on a sign, death to all Jews, and record it so that I can react so to I it. So I can react to so it. So two right. dudes saw this and goes, oh, that's easy money. Yeah. And they did it. Now, the guys, okay. the guys have claimed that they didn't know what it meant. Which I don't know how much I believe that. Well, but no. like, weren't those dudes in not, like Malawi or something like that? I, I have no idea. I have no idea. But, I mean, it, that's pretty cavalier yeah. if you don't even bother to figure out what you're writing down on a sign. I mean, if I took, if I took that Fiverr job, I would definitely run that through Google Translate. Because if you have access to yeah. Fiverr, now, but you see, have access to Google Translate. I mean, you do, but not necessarily. I mean, Robbie, where were these dudes from that actually unfurled the sign? Oh, I forget where where it took place. It's not. It's not like some guys did this in the middle. No, of like no, no. France it, 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 it was like over that. in. Uh, it was in the Middle East somewhere. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about people having access to Fiverr, and they may have that, but. At the same time, do, do these guys really have the nuance to understand something like that? And I'm not trying to say anything about anyone's intelligence. I'm saying socially, well, culturally, and, la- and language wise, and, and language barrier wise, is that something they truly understand? And this, yeah, whole, no, and this th- whole conversation right here too was also one of the, the the nuances that PewDiePie said he was trying to outline was look what we can get away with on Fiverr. Yeah, uh, and and I, I I mean, so. I don't know. I, I mean, like, I th- to me, yeah, I I would do the due diligence and run th- uh, four words through mm-hmm. Google Translate. Mm-hmm. That seems pretty fucking. I mean, easy. but also if you're, but it's, I'm, and I'm just saying, like, that's an easy. That's a really, really easy excuse to go. Oh, we didn't know what it means. Like, that's that's. I th- I'm not trying to say it's an excuse. I'm just saying that there's nuances. I'm just saying that even if it even if they did know what it meant, it's still stupid. I Fine, would never do, I would never do that, but at the same time, I'm somebody who understands, you know, different cultural sensitivities. But at, at, at the same time, I'm not going to accept that as an excuse. I am not going to accept that like, oh, I didn't know no, what it means. I you think, know, you no, could have figured it out. I think that's out. a I think that's a weaker excuse than PewDiePie just being a dick, which I think is the biggest issue. Well, here. yeah, but but the thing is is that PewDiePie knew he was being a dick. He mm-hmm. knew what he was doing. Yeah. He knew exactly what he was I feel like doing. if you're going to do something like that, like was he pr- he was purposely trying to call out Fiverr, or he was just because that's feel like what he says. Because he's had, uh, but he's, he's okay. saying that so, now well, after the on. fact, right? The issue is that he's done stunts before mm-hmm. that have been questionable according to Fiverr's ethics, and Fiverr, it needs to be mentioned, is an Israeli-run company, right. so he mm-hmm. figured that this would get. The, I mean, he was trying to poke a middle finger into Fiverr's eye for sure for sure but I, I you know like straight up though I'm gonna put I'm gonna, I'm gonna still just push push up uh, uh, back against you on on that one Nate because I don't care what he was trying to do I don't care what type of point he was trying to make towards Fiverr or towards anyone for that matter but you're a content creator you exist in a certain context in a certain vacuum and to somehow you know sit back and and just do it anyway i get that he's trying to make a joke and be edgy and whatnot but i mean dude when your stuff kind of ventures into hate speech bro like and you get sponsorships from american companies who have american standards and practices that they have to follow dog it's hate speech that's not hate it's hate speech it's not it's hate speech it's hate speech when somebody says death to all jews and somebody actually tried to kill off all jews context that's hate no 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 no, no, no. hang on no no context is context there's no excuse here context and intent matter especially when talking about humor Mm-hmm. Especially think, when talking about no, I think about you're humor. right. I think it matters when looking at PewDiePie as a character, but when you're looking at the fact that he's sponsored by Disney, you have to think for a second about what Disney's going to find acceptable. And if you don't give a shit, then you have to be prepared to deal with the consequences. Absolutely. The Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that's and I and I'll I'll a hundred percent say that is that PewDiePie knew what he was doing mm-hmm. and he needs to accept the consequences of what he did. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is that when you're talking about humor, I think that there are different rules than the 
the strict civil society rules that we put so on what everyone was else. His, so what was his what was his context here? What was his what was his point or his cultural critique or his nuance that he was trying to make? Because if he was trying to make some sort of structured deconstruction of Fiverr or what it means to use the word Jew or all this other intelligent crap, no, that's then not. that would have been wonderful. No, I'll then if he would have came back, that'd have been great. But instead, what he did was make a joke that he knew was gonna piss people off, and now he's playing the woe is me card because he got dropped. So no, and, I don't feel. And on the episode great. he reacted to it, was he reacting to, oh my god, I can't believe somebody unrolled? Like he did, had no idea that he was the one who paid them, or was he like, oh look what I did on Fiverr, guys? Now here's the thing: if he didn't call out Fiverr from the start, I'm a little bit hesitant to say that that was his intention. Now, now here's the thing: I'm not going to sit and say what his intention is, okay? But that was clearly a joke and the joke is an actual that's an old school radio bit it's been done by howard stern it's been done by opie and anthony i can't tell you how many times and so that makes it cool though right no but I, in fact opie and anthony got in trouble for for something but, very but very similar also not an opie the, and hang on the, hang on i take umbrage with that but okay. but i'm gonna but I will say this, okay, that Opie and Anthony got hooked off of of uh, the air in uh, New York for audio of uh, apparently two people having sex in a church. And the gag is, the joke is, to have someone doing something outrageous, whether they're attached to your staff or not. A lot of times for this joke, Howard Stern or Opie and Anthony would use an intern or, uh, you know, they would get callers to call up and do it so that there would be a wall of, uh, you know, responsibility, not responsibility, but being able to react to something. That's where the comedy is driven okay. from. And so that's the construction of the joke right there and if you have that I, I think having that context and having that construction is important and and that intent is important because this is shit that people have gotten away with for years and i don't like like the context of pewdiepie just being pewdiepie and like nika said he's not supposedly a comedian i disagree with that because we're all especially in this day and age we're all as entertainers trying to figure out the mediums that we have to work with it used to be that there were only three mediums there was True. stage there was tv and there was radio and you had one of those three options and stage was the one where you could get in front of people the easiest it took some refinement it took some effort to be able to get on tv then you had cable break and you had a whole lot more opportunities to entertain people around cable and the acceptable content started to grow as well okay so as this started to grow now you have the internet which is a platform for literally fucking anyone and it's a platform for funny people so just the fact that he uses youtube as his platform does not discount him from being a oh, comedian and nor, That's nor, not what I was trying to say. nor does it discount him from being an entertainer and we should be considering him as such no 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 it's pretty I, not... un, it's pretty unfair and disingenuous to that's him. not what i was trying to say at all yeah. actually as a creator to 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 do that no, no i'm not saying you are but a lot of people who have been chiming in on this this conversation or uh you know posting this to their facebook walls or whatever that they've been piling on and that's their attitude that he's not a comedian and that's incorrect and that's incorrect and that's why i was saying if there's some type of point behind his words then come back and explain what you were trying to say that's all i'm not i would never try to discredit and say he's not an entertainer or or a personality that's that's stupid that's just not logic so so but but going back to that i'm just saying that even though he is an entertainer and even though he's doing all those things i'll defend his right to say whatever he wants to say as both a human being a content creator whatever you want anybody can say anything that they want to i would never try to say that he can't do that but also i get angry at the fact that i see people who are somehow angry that people are mad at him and i also defend people's rights to be offended by what someone says if somebody sits back and says hey dude i think you were kind of being a dick by saying that then maybe you're supposed to be but two, shouldn't that be two adult humans and have a conversation 
or whatever but to say that he can make what he can make and somehow his audience or whoever becomes his audience is not supposed to react in a certain way or however they feel i think that's just as disingenuous to an audience as it is to a creator but shouldn't that be up to the audience right because here's here and here's the problem that i have and this is what raises a lot of red flags personally is when the wall street journal got involved and then subsequently disney ended up dropping him because he had done this joke this video had was made months ago right months ago and it, look we have this show we've got checkpoint radio we i think that we're pretty good about keeping up on gaming news and what's happening in terms of a dialogue inside the gaming world this video made no fucking traction when it first came out it got zero fucking traction when it first came out the story that got traction was disney dumped him and right. that was after the wall street journal got involved and reached out to disney personally right. now that to me that's the part i i, I disagree with you that totally. that to i mean I'm, i agree with you that, to me that seems like the most sketchy thing out of any of this yeah. like okay pewdiepie tells a shitty joke people react whatever he's trying to push a line he's being shitty what fucking ever but when the wall street journal gets involved and reaches out to disney there is a subtext that goes mm -hmm. on there norris mm -hmm. you know about this because you've worked in media you've worked in newsrooms there's a subtext that's going on there mm -hmm. and to me that gets way 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 too close to activist journalism mm -hmm. to sit comfortably i mean it's a dangerous me. notion to to sit back especially first of all i i believe that if you're a news provider then you have no business giving any company a heads up on any story. I don't care if this company buys a billion dollars of ad space in your paper every day. That's if, sketchy. Yeah, it's sketch. So if the Wall Street Journal was going to do a story about this video, wonderful. Run the story and then if Disney drops him after that story breaks, fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because that's just the nature of how journalism and news is supposed to work. But the fact that they called Disney personally is the part about the story that I think one is more dangerous. Yeah. Two is definitely the bigger story in my opinion yeah. because I've I've never liked PewDiePie. I really don't care about PewDiePie. And I'm not a fan of his and, content either. Right. So so him saying that in 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 the reaction to it I'm not bothered by that. What I am bothered by is the fact that you had a news company reach out to a private company and say, hey, guys, uh, one of your employees did this. And ba they basically just snitched on him. Yeah. And instead yeah. of doing that's actual exactly what it is. real yeah. reporting, which yeah. disappoints me because that's supposed to be one of our pillars of journalism. But do you think, I, I mean, can you, can you at least maybe admit a little personal bias in this story? Uh, Completely. Because you don't, I mean, you did admit that you're not a fan of PewDiePie. I'm not a fan of PewDiePie either. I don't think but anyone I, here is. No, I don't yeah. know. He's not a fan of PewDiePie, but he's still mad that the Wall Street Journal called him out to his sponsor. Well, so, no, no, no. But, if you but, can not like someone but still think he was fired unfairly because of the bad news practices, I think that that's actually not bias. Well, no, but I, but I think I, I, I mean, I think that there is a little bit of bias because I think it would bother you on a personal level if it was someone that you liked, like if it was someone that you were personally invested in, right? I mean, I would, I would. But he's saying it still does bother him, is what he's no, saying. No, I'm he's saying it's still bothered. Still bothered by the fact I, no, no, I, 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 I'm not saying that, but I'm, but you, you also did admit being a little bit personal, like the backlash it, it didn't initially raise any red flags with you. No, 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 no. And I, I'll admit my bias on this in terms of the content that we're talking about for a multitude of reasons but i also want to say i can still remove myself out of my personal mm -hmm. feelings about what he said and did and still look at it objectively from a, 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 a professional perspective and say you know what the wall street journal kind of did something that was unethical here yeah and we should be talking about that instead of just focusing on the issue we can look around you know the stuff around it on the periphery and say all right that's something that we can be upset about in instead of in instead of writing uh pieces on GQ. I literally read this on GQ where uh, they basically took PewDiePie and Milo and crammed them in. They were like, 
PewDiePie and Milo found the edge of the internet. No, and, I mean, that's, you dude, cannot, that's not fair. That is dangerous. That is fucking... That's not fair. It's dangerous, and it's so unfair to PewDiePie yeah. to put him in the same category as, as Milo. Milo. I would never do that. Because Milo is pure, unbridled, in-your-face hatred. And he would... It, it, it's it's like that Patton Oswalt joke where he's like, you got to listen to what's in their heart, right? Mm -hmm. If it, it doesn't matter what the words somebody uses are. That's why I say content, uh, context and intent matter. Where I don't think that PewDiePie was any kind of secret Nazi. You know right. what I mean? Like, I don't think he has any hatred toward Jews. No, he, but he but, just wants, and I understand what he did was tone deaf and it was offensive. There we go. And, and, but the thing is, though, is that he could, I mean, even knowing that, if you know that at the time, I think that, you know, like, if that's your intent, then that should be your intent. If he didn't have any big moral lesson to teach at the end of it, I think that is to that is basically to his detriment. But he's not in the same category as Milo. No. That that's the guy who uses all of the politically correct words, but says all of the vile, vitriolic, hate, vi basic hatred shit. Yeah. And 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 it's like the fact that it took people that long to figure figure him out is shocking to me. But they are not the same thing. No, no way. No way. I would never sit back and, and put PewDiePie on that type of level. First of all, as you said, because Milo has a ton of nuance. He's, I can hate him and I can think he's a shit, but he's not a dummy. So no, he's he knows, far from a dumb. Yeah, yeah he's, he's far he's, from dumb. He's in an evil way brilliant. Yeah. So you look at somebody like that and then to compare him to somebody like PewDiePie, who, I mean, I'll admit, I think he has a lot of complete insensitivity sure. to a lot of stuff sure. and that's a whole nother conversation but at the same time i don't think he's running around trying to sponsor legislation that would you know be detrimental to jewish people right or detrimental to gay people let me let me try to draw an analogy that i think is a little bit more fair pewdiepie getting in trouble is a little bit like Daniel Tosh's rape joke that he got in trouble for, whereas Milo mm -hmm. is a little bit more like Michael Richards and the rant that he he did on stage where you saw some genuine, like, vile shit yeah. come out of that guy, yeah. and you're like, oh my God, that's that's fucking real. Yeah. Like, there's, th you, and, and you have and you to be able, it. you have to be able to know the difference between that. You have to be able to tell the difference between when somebody is putting on an act and they're pushing buttons because they want the reaction mm -hmm. and that's the point of the piece versus someone who you caught on a bad day <laughs> and they let some shit that they don't normally say right. slide like there's there's a difference between that shit right. and, and I mean it, again my overall point is that people regardless of the intent from the creator have the right to react to whatever is made in whatever oh, way they want just like the creator as you just said can make whatever it is that they want to make even if they're trying to put buttons i will defend that right to the death of me i would never tell him that he can't make the joke i can call him an idiot for absolutely making the joke, yes but i would never say he can't do it but also as you were just saying and again i i think Nate, i think you and i ag agree on the larger things that are going on sure. here you and i can disagree on the delivery of said uh, point or said uh, uh, bit, but we can agree on the fact that hey, the Wall Street Journal was wrong, mm -hmm. and you know that was really not their place to do that. Right. And but we'll disagree on the fact of should Disney have dropped him or not, or was that proper or whatever. I, I, whatever man, whatever. I, that's. I think that that is 100% on Disney. It's Disney's choice. I'm not going to say whether it was right or not. Either way. I also kind of understand why it's problematic for Disney to be attached to someone who's saying anti-Semitic stuff. Exactly. Like, they don't necessarily have the best track record in that department. So, I kind of understand that. And and I, I don't really bemoan that all that much. But I think that... You know, I'd like people to be thinking a little bit more consciously about Wall Street Journal's role in this whole thing. And not only that, but I think YouTube stepping in and dropping him from their premium uh, service 
is also a little bit odd. Now, granted, YouTube, again, is a privately held company. They are able to run their company exactly how they want to run it. And when we sign up for the terms of service, we're signing up for their rules. It's their platform. We've talked about this plenty on the show. This is why we don't monetize on YouTube. This is why YouTube's an afterthought. It's nice to have a presence there because it exposes people to what you're making. But at the end of the day, we want to drive people to the podcast. We want right. we want people to be subscribed to the podcast. Right. And you know, for these creators that do end up banking on YouTube as their only you know method of delivery, as their only primary income source. Yeah, yeah. And, and as their primary income source, they have a lot different stake in this. And I think that a move like that is very troubling uh, and should be really troubling to uh, you know to content creators uh, that use YouTube because what that says is the minute YouTube doesn't like what you're doing, they're free to change the rules. Yeah, and I mean, but also I think it's, it's incumbent upon the content creators to always kind of be mindful of that because, again, as much as I defend people to have the right to make whatever it is that they want to make, at the same time, YouTube being a part of Alphabet and Alphabet has its own set of standards and practices and whatever, whatever they find is acceptable, you have to kind of almost look at it as like an employee employer relationship then, in a way. Then it's got to be across the. Then it's got. Like, I totally agree. Like if they enforce it against someone like PewDiePie in the midst of a big backlash like this, then I think that they have to go through with a fine tooth comb on every other YouTube creator's pieces of content, and not just what they're putting to the premium service, but what they've been putting to their traditional YouTube yeah. channel as well to figure out well yeah. who else is violating this yeah. as as and, well because to I mean, selectively enforce. It that doesn't sit well with me. No, and I agree, but it also you know doesn't help when one of your biggest content creators does something like this. It it does put YouTube in an interesting bind as well because if you have maybe somebody who has three hundred subscribers and and you know fifty views on every video, well, we're talking about their ideas and consciousness is not spreading that that far and that influence not really being that big of an but, impact of what's going on but then they're and, not they're not eligible for that premium service then that, they're not eligible that, to be a premium and, that, and that's true but we're talking about youtube as a whole as you were saying even on the traditional service right so i i think that pewdiepie in a in a weird kind of roundabout way his popularity also harmed this him just, just in. In. Chris oh, all cool. juice. we need to contact vendor media productions and see if they drop it okay well can you at least write an article first that's the appropriate well no 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 no, no no we have to drop you and that's the article they write about uh, yeah, us dropping yeah, you yeah, no yeah, the yeah, article yeah. is suggesting that you drop me keep I, on, keep i'm i'm the head of bender media production so i'm pretty sure I, that you just tattled on, me. on your s- uh, they just tattled on me okay right well, now it doesn't count though you have to have an article for can it. we fire chris i think that's what it comes yeah down to. yeah i'm okay with that you're fired you're fired take nika with you no <laughs> you can't take that? me with you <laughs> i'm here for good but i mean i think i mean i think that this is definitely an issue that you know content creators across the board should be paying attention to not just as like whether it's fair or not whether you know, you should take action or not, because I'm not I'm not going to be the guy to tell you what to do in right. this. I just I, my point of view is that it's not as straight ahead. And I'm not going to I'm not going to chastise PewDiePie for making a joke like he tried something and it didn't work. It blew up in his face. I think that it's really shitty to lose out on opportunities because of that. But when you're an entertainer, the onus is on you to try to elicit a reaction. And I know I I know that kind of pressure to, you know, try to figure out what's funny. What's the, the question of what's funny is actually a really difficult question to answer in 2017 because there are so many places that comedy has been taken that used to be taboo areas, mm-hmm. whether you're talking about sex, whether you're talking about biology, whether you're talking about language. It's, those boundaries have been pushed so far that you've got to really dance a razor's edge to be able to try to figure out what people are going to react to right. now. Daniel Tosh, I, love him or hate him, I don't give a shit what you 
think about him, you got to respect the fact that he's been doing a show for, what, 11 years? Like, 12 years now? And he's still on the air? And he's still fucking funny. Like, every time I watch Tosh.0, oh, I'm laughing. Because mm-hmm. he's funny every single time. I saw his uh, 2016 stand-up special. Blisteringly funny. Great material. Right. I and 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 I just ke- I keep thinking like, dude, had PewDiePie been Daniel Tosh, no one would have batted an eye at this. It, had that been a cutaway on Tosh point oh, nobody would have even thought. But twice. it comes down to knowing your audience, and that's another thing. And also but knowing I, who you're he, sponsored he, by. But that's and th- know who you're sponsored by. But well, it comes down to it, that's a different that's a different kind of fish. That's a different argument. But it comes down to knowing your audience. Yes, Daniel Tosh has figured out his audience for the better part of ten you years. You know what to expect from you Daniel know what Tosh. to expect from every him. time. And, and but that starts. That's a very slow process. Mm-hmm. That is something that doesn't happen just overnight. The thing with PewDiePie is that he's on YouTube and YouTube. YouTube is, and forgive me for using this term, but it is the home of the SJW. So straight up and so straight up and down, or Twitter, or, or Twitter, Twitter, or Twitter, or Twitter. But YouTube, you can do videos and visuals, a whole nother Fair. impact. Yeah. But it's home for a lot of the quote unquote. Wait, conscious- Tumblr, Tumblr is Tumblr. the or- yeah, Tumblr yeah, is the that's, origin. That's, that's, that's oh, dude, I haven't been on Tumblr in years. Stay away. So. <laughs> I, that's all it is now. But yeah, again, in terms of making, yeah. yeah. You know, substantial video, actual video content, content that might actually halfway be good. Uh, you go to YouTube for stuff like that, and you can hear a lot of conflicting arguments about this type of stuff. And by PewDiePie being a primary YouTube contributor or primary YouTube personality, I think he made a gross misjudgment on his viewers on his audience I and that disagree though I mean, if you if he wants that to be his audience fine but he has to prepare for all the setbacks he's going to get in the meantime while he forms his audience around that because his current audience is not that but that hang on hang on though the, and this is mentioned specifically in the gq article it's almost bemoaned by the author in there that since making this joke he hasn't seen an audience fall off like his YouTube numbers, his organic audience that he gets on his YouTube yeah. page has not seen a hit. He's, it was yeah. just it was it was the fact that YouTube stepped in and took down his premium channel and that Disney dropped him. Those were yes. the only t- Well, and one of the primary things about doing big, you know, quote unquote stunts like this is that whether people like you or don't like you, they're still subscribing so they can keep up on all of your and, drama. Dude, and, that's, and that's another thing is a like and a dislike is still marked as uh interaction on YouTube. So it doesn't matter if he has a yeah. billion dislikes, it's still going to be p- pushing his videos to the top of the front page right and the thing is is that we see this sort of expectation with limit break radio a lot because the show is popular because people know the show they know the brand and then they go well you have some kind of expectation to be mature on your show like you you know like how are you guys sitting there telling dick and fart jokes like here's the thing is that People get, I, 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 people get so offended even at the smallest things yeah. that it's like like when you're knowingly pushing the envelope and you know that what you are putting out there is going to ruffle the feathers, like, I think that that does show that you do know your audience well enough because you didn't lose them. I like, mean, no, that... Uh, and, and having, that, having the sponsorship opportunity, that's a very different thing. you got to make different choices when you're under the magnifying glass like that, and you got to know that that's a possibility. Yeah, but they hate watching is a real thing, dude. Like, there are plenty of people who watch videos of people they strongly dislike. I, I to, know that. We, personally. Right, we, <laughs> so, we bank on this. Right. This is that, so, as a content creator... If he was banking on that, bravo, master stroke. But as a human being or somebody making a conscious decision to consume his content or not, I'm kind of like, fuck PewDiePie, because I just think it was stupid to do. Yeah, and, 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 and I choose to not interact with his content at all. And I think if you're a conscious consumer and that's something that you really draw the line at, then don't watch him. Don't watch him. Don't comment. Don't. Then that's what you do. You don't 
you know, make a stink or a reaction video about yeah, you something. Get, you something go, you move the fuck on. Yeah. And this is what we tell people with Limit Break Radio. If you don't like it, you don't get it. And we're not making it for you. You can move on. And that's fine. Nobody's hurt in that transaction. Except someone, someone gets their feelings hurt. And then what really happens? What happens when someone gets their feelings hurt? Right. Nothing. Nobody gets cancer. A fucking puppy doesn't die. Like, noth- genuinely nothing measurable happens when someone gets but offended. In the, but in the same sense, a dick and fart joke is nowhere near the same ballpark as a deaf to Jews joke. There's an entire different social context by even mentioning it. Whether that's right or wrong, we're not even going we go. to... Hey, hey. I'm not trying to argue. No, but to I'm not, not trying to argue yeah, yeah, either. But to not acknowledge that there's a big we, vast difference in that. We do more than dick and fart jokes. That's Just right. Just last week, Chris made a 9-11 joke. That's true. Well, no, well, but, but I, he's American. He has more context to make a nine eleven joke. Let me let me tell you, let me tell you an actual joke that did get us backlash. Genuine backlash. We had made uh, we had made it. We had made a. a, a we were talking about Moon Brita. Yeah, we were talking about Moon Brita and how and, she didn't matter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, oh, I know where this is. I know yeah, this joke. <laughs> Rogan and Lives Matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got tons of shit for that yeah that's tons. Called, that's called, ridiculous because all over the media you see people saying like cat lives matter it's everywhere guess what those people cat are, lives listen, do matter thank listen, you very listen. much and those people are equally as stupid as mm. all the other stuff as us for making that joke but no 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 no, no, no. stupid but, it was but, being but, but, stupid me, on let purpose finish, let me finish let it was finish. literally just like are you saying rogan and lives matter let and me i was finish. like yeah it's, it's and then we literally stu- moved on it's all stupid <laughs> but also the people listening to you that's the wrong thing to get mad at that's not a subs- a substantive thing to be angry about like if, I, if you're offended about somebody making a blank mark lives matter joke i get it but get mad at the people who may have some sort of structural power to make the other shit happen you can't get mad at a bunch of uh, at a two radio hosts for making a fictional race lives matter especially that's dumb i understand that people are actually talking shit about the black lives matter movement that is a very different conversation but literally to just replace a word that's what they and that's use it in context and then move on after five seconds i feel like it's just way over but that's literally what we were being accused of we were being accused of making light of black lives matter Mm -hmm. apparently the podcast had come out on the anniversary of alton sterling's death you know like it it it, like we knew that like (laughs) come on like i've got my calendar of you know, uh, uh, police brutality that I can line up my jokes according to. Come the fuck on! Like I get that. Uh, like, like that's but that's taking that's especially taking because it was just so far. in and it was just so in the moment, and it was only like it was only like a three second joke, and then we instantly moved but on. So it was this, like but Twitter lost their fucking <laughs> mind. I have people in the FF14 community that still have me blocked on Twitter because of because that shit. it came to light that you're also a rapist because you make jokes. <laughs> about rape <laughs> no I, I don't make jokes about rape but you are complacent He's just not bothered in them. by them in comedy here's the here's the point here's the point <laughs> getting mad at lbr or getting mad at pewdiepie is one thing for anything anybody says as a content creator however if your objective is to somehow you know bring to the light uh the plight of a specific group of people then getting mad at lbr does nothing to help your cause if anything it makes you look weak and 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 silly defensive and and defensive for going after something that has no structural power now if you guys had eight million uh, eight million views every day and you were making that no. type of thing no and you were making that type of thing consistently that let does- me finish my sentence <sighs> mate and you were doing that type of thing consistently then i can see why somebody would continue to take more of an umbrage but if it's one joke in a vacuum about a character in the game that we clearly know does not fucking matter so that's a lot of fucking qualifiers on that sentence. Like, that's a lot of ifs. That's a lot of if statements there. That's and, life, man. And, life no, is me, qualifiers. No way. No way. Whether we have 8,800 or 8 million people, it doesn't matter. Like, I should be able to pursue the same style and level of humor that I think is funny or pursuable, regardless of how many people are watching me. Man, but that goes against the social contract, man. The more, you're, the more you are known, the less privacy and the less 
less uh, 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 the more effect your words yeah, have. Nate, Nate, That's I, a direct opposite Nate, of, of of what the social contract is, which is a real thing. It's conceptual. It's the same reason why people are so angry at our current president right now because there are some things that he've said that he said that aren't necessarily quote unquote offensive but they're just things that a president is not supposed to say quote unquote and people get offended by that why because he's the most visible person in our country of in the world else in the world <laughs> so to say that your level of followers or the level of how much people know you is inconsequential is not only disingenuous to the people you're speaking to, but it's also disingenuous to the fact that you can literally project your opinion and consciousness into the world. I don't think that's true. When you look at someone like a George Carlin, who even after he got massively famous and had his content drugged through the court system, that's how, that's how fucking famous George Carlin was. Yeah. At one point, he had entire law, you know, U United States law uh, and FCC policy crafted after one of his stand up bits. Mm -hmm. OK, when you have a career like that, I think that if you start to second guess yourself when you have millions of people watching, mm -hmm. it undercuts what you're trying to project out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that you see that you see that with comedians that end up getting huge and then they're shit just takes a slide I feel like, like you two are talking about two different things right now two different making two different points because nate you're right just because we have tons and tons and tons of viewers we shouldn't change our content but what norris is saying is that if you keep making that same real life jokes over and over and over someone's gonna start to you know like tweak in on why does he keep saying that is there something deeper it's something, in there yeah, right it's something there? subconscious going yeah. on there. But um, and what I'm saying is that if you strip out context from everything that you can make those those shadows appear everywhere. That's like fair. You, you can make you, you can make that context from nothing. Like you I think that's what is happening with PewDiePie is people keep stripping out context. People keep stripping out the you know, everything that was around the death to all Jews joke mm -hmm. and just focusing on that sign and mm -hmm. then celebrating like they've taken down a Nazi when in reality you've got Alex Jones on his fucking who has the era of media of a network. President. Yeah, who is who the president has has explicitly praised and said, I will not disappoint you like i will not let you down has yeah. said those words oh. to alex jones this is a guy who in the same week told um jennifer lopez to go get gang raped in somalia because of what she said at the fucking grammys yeah. okay so when you when you want to judge hate speech yeah. i think that 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 those kinds of things existing sort of undercut that point that undermine that point that PewDiePie was trying to perpetuate any kind of hate speech right. when you're calling that out but you're not calling this and out and that's and that's my point is my point is your your targets quote unquote have to be more directed and they have to be more substantive so i agree with you on that point that getting angry at PewDiePie for something and let's not even delve too far into you know the number of people because i think we kind of all agree like you know i you should keep doing your content but at the same time don't just be an ass just for the sake of being an ass but that's what i mean that's what our show is that's what my character is i'm an asshole for being a, but for the yeah sake of but being you an still asshole. but you still present more than just being an asshole there's still some sort of information behind all of your asshole there's, there's more there's more subtlety there's more, to there's it more than subtlety what to it. that's what i'm there you go rob there's more subtlety to it than that but what I'm saying is, is that you have to have some sort of, I'm not saying change your content, but I'm saying have the consciousness to understand the backlash that you're about to get. And I don't think he truly thought of that. I actually no, think, I agree with that. I actually think that he thought up and like you said, the video got no traction when it was originally published. So yep, here's another video falling into the abyss of the Internet and the Wall Street Journal brought this back up. So what I'm saying is, is you have to just continue to be aware of your audience and the, aware of the type of reactions you're getting. Because if you're an asshole just to be an asshole, that's fine. But don't be angry or upset or, you know, bemused, not bemused, but upset that your content is all of a sudden not on a premium channel and you've been dropped by your sponsors. You can't be surprised by that. I just, I think it's sad that 
none of these, you know, YouTube, Google, Alphabet, whatever you want to call, or uh, Disney wasn't able to recognize that. That wasn't able to recognize, like, look, this is an entertainer trying to be an entertainer. And yeah, that was an off color joke. And yeah, maybe, you know, issue I mean, a warning of some is kind. This, but I mean, yeah, I was going to say, is this his first offense? Like, couldn't they have issued maybe, like, hey, don't do this shit again or we'll drop you? No, I see, mean, I don't know. We don't know if that conversation's been had. Yeah, before. we have no we idea. Don't know. So I, we, I don't think we can speculate on that. I, I, I get why Disney did. I know you guys will be like, oh, Disney has no room to, you know, say anything. But they're not going to come and be like, look, we realize that PewDiePie said and did something offensive, but you know what? We were founded by a Nazi, so we can't in good <laughs> conscience drop his... Like, no. They're a family company. You're, you're they're right. going to drop it. Right. YouTube, on the other hand, it, this happened weeks after the video. Somebody at YouTube saw that beforehand, yeah. and the fact they didn't cut his premium until he was dropped by Disney is that's, definitely yeah, fucked. That's, exactly. that's horrible. That's exactly my fucking point, is that there are so many... like. I, and I'm not going to go all to, as so far as to say, like, uh, you know, I, I guess that there is a whole cadre of YouTubers out there who, if you're not 100% supporting PewDiePie, oh my gosh. They're, they're, yes. they're like, they're equally like stupid. getting, getting it's drugged so through the mud. Fucking dumb. Equally stupid. But the thing is, though, is that, look, I'm, I can't, I, I'm not going to defend PewDiePie 100% because... I think you you bring up a good point, Norris. Like, if you're going to pursue that level of content, if you're going to pursue trying to push that boundary, then you've got to be able to accept the consequences right. or absor at least absorb the consequences. Right. And, you know, I, I while I do have my opinions about Disney's role, the Wall Street Journal's role, and how much focus or not that should have, regardless of... Each of these companies are private companies. They have the right to react however they're going to react. And he needs to, like, he knew that. Like, he definitely right. knew that before doing any of this. Right, which is why I think it's even more silly the, not necessarily the supporters, because, again, support who you want. That's your choice. But to s sort of drag other YouTubers for saying, you know, I really don't like this guy. No, it's not even like, that. It's not even that. Uh, uh, I forget the dude's name, Septic Eye or something like that. It, basically, someone who PewDiePie helped like you know, like push him into the limelight. Right. Basically, released a video, super level headed, saying kind of all the same stuff we do. Like, look, you know, PewDiePie is my friend. He made a tasteless joke. I defend his right to make jokes. Wasn't the best. Like, he was right middle, right down the line mm -hmm. with everybody. And comments were like, wow, you fucking backstabber. How do you have the fucking nerve? You should be like at his fucking feet, groveling. Like, it's like. What the fuck video did you just watch? This guy isn't right. even against him. Right. And I mean, this again, it's first of all, it's, I just stay out of the comments of YouTube just yeah. in general, which is the fuck. It's probably a good philosophy. The cesspool of humanity. But the part that just makes me so unsettled about that is that you see this like polarization of everyone and people are just afraid to be measured in an opinion or moderate in an opinion yeah as uh, and i'm not saying like i'm i know everything about the situation but there's things about the situation i think are kind of unfair to pewdiepie there are such part of the situation that i think pewdiepie was kind of being a jerk so two things can be you know correct at the same time and i think for somebody to have a measured response as it pertains to something like this is really kind of the only way to really look at it because there's a lot of degrees and a lot of levels and i think to pick just one side and to say oh I, hashtag i'm with pewdiepie or you know this other side where you know everybody's just completely against them and anybody who supports them that's just as poisonous man and what everybody has to do is to say hey you know what pewdiepie you've had some repercussions from what you did or said in your video all right i'm done with you but let's also deal with this big chunk of people over here who are just outraged at pewdiepie let's let's just Let's just extrapolate that. You're upset at PewDiePie when you have people, as you said, like, you know, Alex Jones or Infowars as a whole or just Richard a Spencer, of, Richard Spencer, a bunch of people who actually have real influence and can actually make people's lives shitty in real life. So let's just kind of still understand what we're talking about here. So for as much as I can disagree with you, Nate, on many points, 
I'm not going to mo- move to the point of saying, oh, PewDiePie is the scum of humanity. That's dumb. Let's, uh, it's a waste of time. Let's open it up to our phone lines uh, and talk to Heartslot. Heartslot, what's going on? Hey, can you guys hear me all right? Uh, yeah, you're very loud, but it's fine. Don't worry. We go- we can adjust you on this end. Don't, don't, you don't need to do anything. What's up? Uh, not much. I just wanted to put my two cents on this whole manufactured story bullshit with the Wall Street Journal. Just for the fact that they actually went out of their way, it seems, to be able to go out and drum something up like this weeks after the fact. And you know the fact that the only reason that they even ever did this was just the point of being able to stir up controversy and hits, basically, for just the whole point of we're in the area era of Trump where everybody is all nice and sensitive to all these different things, but they weren't how many months ago? And they weren't reporting facts or truth on anything how many months ago, and the shithead got put in office? Right. And now you're trying to white knight? Now you're trying to do something? Now you're trying to be the better people? A uh, freaking Rupert Mur- Murdoch paper? <laughs> I mean, it does seem pretty disingenuous for people to be getting involved and outraged now uh, when, uh, uh, you know, like we've said, there are so many other clear, uh, you know, uh, uh, clear targets for genuine, you know, genuine uh, influence. You know what I mean? Like, there are people who have real influence in this country that are saying things way, way more dangerous than what PewDiePie had two dumb motherfuckers write on a sign. And I just, I, I mean, we've spent two episodes now talking about this, and I'll, I've seen more, I've seen this article shared more in the last two weeks than I've seen anything else shared. Like, it is the story that will not fucking die. And I don't, maybe that's just what my friends and their opinions on the story are. But at the same time, like, it, it, I, I feel like this is what everyone is talking about. And I, I think that just the tone that people are taking is a really, really unfair and also really, really dangerous when it comes to free speech. I, I, I you know, and. And having having that point undercut underneath you, like, oh, here's the free speech argument, like that just drives me fucking crazy. I mean, it, that's a but it's a simple thing, man. Anybody can say whatever it is that they want to say, and anybody can react. Freedom of speech is not freedom of consequence. I don't care what anybody says in a in a vacuum, but I also don't care if people hold you responsible for that. So that's a dumb argument to begin with and it's dumb to be outraged that people would make the argument again because everybody wants to be and I, and I think this goes back kind of to what the caller was speaking about it it, it, it is kind of cool right now to be outraged about something whether it's PewDiePie whether it's Trump, Trump yeah. whether it's whatever it, it, it's the wave to be outraged about something but in the same sense you know outrage isn't something that it's going to spark somebody to do something, but it's not going to bring about a substantive solution, which is why you have to be measured after your initial outrage. So if people really feel this strongly about PewDiePie, then write him a letter. Get them on some sort of podcast to actually pick his brain. Talk about yeah, it. Yeah, no one, like no one called him out for the joke except for one very high-profile, powerful news organization. And even then, they didn't even let it out for public opinion. They took it straight to his money source. Yeah, and I honestly, I haven't seen, you know, even, you know, too big... And, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm, I'm not following him. But I haven't seen just, you know, on front pages or anything another youtuber just reach out to him and say hey man let's talk about this because i think people might be misunderstanding you or maybe there's something about what you said that you might not no understand. i mean like like he's put out reactionary jokes where he's like oh okay it was bad i'll i'll take the consequences blah 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 blah, blah. i learned from it but it's just your you know usual but, I, bullshit. That, but that's yeah, what it's I'm like saying, your boilerplate man. apology yeah, but that's what I mean. So even if it's a boilerplate ap- apology, nobody's challenged him directly. And that's kind of what I'm saying is that if you're that outraged, challenge the man directly does, in, a, in, does, a, in a forum. Don't sit there in, in you know, you brew crap, I yeah, and brew crap in the comments. I understand what you're saying if you're that outraged. But I mean, like, my, my whole thing is, is like, why, why even get that worked up to begin with? When you can clearly, I mean, the clear read of the situation 
no matter what way you read it, is that it's a joke, is that it's being played for shock value and reaction. Yeah. If you're it's intelligent, not- but all the sheep will see is another Nazi to punch. <laughs> In his episode, though, did he pretend like he had nothing to do with paying those guys? Like, oh, God, I can't believe they did that. I don't, I don't know. I'm, pre- I feel like I'm pretty sure... Like- that's even scummier, I feel like. I'm pretty sure the video's gone. I've tried to look for it. I can't. Yeah, it's probably been taken. I can't, yeah, taken I can't, I can't find it. Now. All I can find is his apology bullshit. Because, yeah, because if, if his episode was like, hey, look, I paid these guys and look at what I was able to do on Fiverr, that's a totally different conversation than if he was like, but I, I, I'm pretending like I had nothing to do with this just to have a video where I reacted to people who... Either, either way, even if he had said that it was part of a setup, like... Yeah, uh, neither even, one are good. Are yeah. good. <laughs> I, but but both to me both are defensible. And yeah. and I and I and I want to talk about humor here for a second because we gotta we've we've only got about five more minutes left in the show before we gotta wrap up. Um but I do want to talk about humor because I think this is the point where Norris, you and I differ a lot. Because I have a very permissive view of humor that everything is funny. Anything mm. can be funny if you put the right words around it, yeah. right? Um, and again, we go back to, to what I was saying. Context matters. Right. It, it, the, whether a joke is funny or not determine, is determined more about the words on either side of that punchline or that big reaction moment mm-hmm. than it is about that moment. Right. If you look at the way that Louis C.K. or Doug Stanhope use language in their act, they use very crass, coarse words hard language right racial language shit that is essentially considered third rail even in comedy context right. but what they say around it is what justifies that joke it, nobody i think you would have a really hard time justifying louis ck or doug stanhope as a racist i think you you know based on even conversations like this you would have a hard time leveling a, a a challenge of racism against this show because we're down to have conversations like this. Well, and, and the thing is, is, is <clears throat> we may differ, but I think, you know, we more so agree on the premise. Again, it's okay for anybody to say what they want to say, and context is important. However, the context also applies to the listener, and I think that's something that, as creators, people kind of really in at least in the PewDiePie context he didn't really think about so for instance right plenty of comedians make like black jokes plenty of white comedians make black jokes sure Tom Tom Segura right exactly or you know like uh, Gary Owens who's like sure made his whole career on quote unquote black you know black people comedy Doug Stanhope as well he he also again uses very racially what would be considered racially charged language but he takes the punch out of it there you go but to the listener, based off what they're talking about, it's clear to for somebody like Gary Owens to maybe a black listener, this is somebody that kind of understands the nuance of what they're saying. And that's part of where, as you said, context comes into play. So not just what they're saying, but also the understanding of sure. what they're saying. Sure. And that's part of where you and I kind of disagree with on humor and comedy is that i don't care what you're talking about but you have to understand the con not just the context of the words you're saying but also the power in the intrinsic meaning of the words that you're saying i agree i agree but doesn't that take learning like doesn't that take crafting totally. that okay so one of the important things about comedy and that every comedian will tell you when they talk about the craft of just doing comedy is that bombing is often the most important part. That learning to fail and get back up again, losing the crowd, and then being able to go on stage the next night and win a crowd and knowing what the difference is, that's kind of the key to between being funny and being a comedian, being someone who gets laughs in in a room full of people, being the guy on stage with a microphone, getting a paycheck for what they're doing. Okay, so if you look at PewDiePie as a comedian and just using a different format than necessarily the stage, then 
we need to be able to give him the freedom to fail, the freedom to bomb. And even if he has 8 million people watching him, the context that the audience should have is that this is entertainment. And man, maybe I didn't find this funny, but he shouldn't be stripped of every opportunity that he's been given as a result. He made a bad joke. He had a bad set. No comedian in the history of comedy has ever has ever been, maybe except for Michael Richards, has had a set that fucking bad. And even then, that's even extent, an extension of what we're seeing in technology because comedians are complaining now that it, every set that they have ever done, <laughs> you know, for the last 10 years, there's someone in the fucking crowd with their cell phone recording mm -hmm. and that it inevitably goes up to YouTube. And if the if they had a bad set, they're judged by that. Right. And a lot of times that can be unfair. You know, it's just as well as I do. TMZ strips context from everything that they can possibly think that they can drum up for hits. And that's exactly what they're going to do with any of these comedian tapes. So comedians do have to ride the same line. And I think that it's going to be on the on audiences and people to understand, like, look, these are entertainers. Mm -hmm. They're going to be trying a variety of things. They're going to be trying to push envelopes. And sometimes they're going to fail. Sometimes they're going to discover why what they said is offensive on its face and not funny. But they need that ability to learn. Right. Because if they don't have that ability to learn, what it does is is it creates safe, soft, bland, boring comedy that nobody wants to listen to. Right. Right. And that's that's my ultimate fear is that someone see is someone on the sideline who has a funny joke that contains Jews in it is watching this unfold going, "Oh shit, man, maybe I shouldn't tell that joke." But it's funny. Like that's that's the individual impact that a discussion or a narrative or a story like mm -hmm. this ends up having. But again, we're we're comparing, in, in my opinion, apples to oranges because it's not like we're talking about a comedian on a stage with a bit that he's fleshed out for five, four, six minutes. We're not talking about but, that. But that. We're talking but, about somebody who literally paid a couple guys to write "Death to Jews" on a sign. Hold up. That doesn't that. It, so what you're talking about in, in terms of somebody being able to bomb a bit or bomb something that they're saying, dude, I get it from the context of a comic, but PewDiePie didn't present that sort of context. He literally just, if anything, what do you tried his best to pass off the responsibility. What do you need to present that context? The stage and a single mic and a pin spot? Like, I, I don't think that you need the context of a stage to be able to drive humor or to you to utilize or use humor. Again, I see PewDiePie as an entertainer that has chosen YouTube as opposed to radio, TV, right. or the stage as his medium. Right. And so that he should be afforded the same opportunities that comedians have. Now, you brought up an important point that it's not the same thing as a comedian coming out with a tight five. How do you think a comedian develops that tight five? Yeah, by he, sucking for a while. He goes, so he, goes to, <laughs> he goes to small stages and open mics where nobody knows him, nobody you know he doesn't have people recording them with the fucking mm -hmm. cell phone it's an un sometimes it's not even an unwritten rule it's a fucking written rule you check your phone at the door because this is a space where we're trying shit out and if you're in if you're on YouTube if YouTube is your medium mm -hmm. then you don't actually you're not afforded that opportunity no you're everything not. everything you put out is under a goddamn microscope and you know what and as unfair as that is that's the reality he I'm chose saying, to exist in. Yeah, he you, didn't choose to be a comedian so he could go to small open mics and try out Jew jokes. Yeah, he's he got didn't a point do here. that. He's got a point there. He chose YouTube. And you know what? With that comes everything that YouTube entails. So we're here talking on a podcast and we understand the context of a podcast, which is why we drop F-bombs and set shit and ass all day. But you know what? If we were going back to Checkpoint and making a radio broadcast that has to be tight for a wide audience that we know has to abide by FCC standards, guess what, Nate? We're not going to be talking about the same but who stuff. who do you think is out there giving PewDiePie these explicit rules or, or restrictions? 
restrictions. He'd be an with idiot not to understand with, them already. No, that's not true. Because you're because with YouTube, especially if you're on the cutting edge and you're driving a lot of that content or culture, then you know what? You're you don't get that blueprint. You don't get that easy blueprint. We got an easy blueprint with Checkpoint. We yep. knew that every segment had to be 15 or 12 minutes, and we adjusted our content to that because that's the specifications of what the job entailed. No one is giving PewDiePie a blueprint for his content. Nobody is saying, look, you can't do this unless it's in the form of, hey, we're taking away your sponsorship. And I think that that's a pretty extreme reaction mm -hmm. for someone to have to what is clearly intended to be a joke. I disagree. I think he'd be silly not to understand the consequences, especially after he's been making videos for how long and has how many subscribers. So we're not talking about some neophyte in YouTube who's just starting out who made a bad joke and got punished for it. We're talking about quite possibly the most successful YouTuber that there has been. And if he didn't understand those contexts, then I'm sorry, dude. I don't feel bad but for But that's you. an unfair expectation. Again, to draw the parallel back to LBR, that's like saying because we've been around for 10 years and we made a conscious decision to change our, our, our on-air strategy and, and the way that we craft content for the show, right down to the very attitude that we project, that because someone in the audience took umbrage with that, that somehow we made a bad call or did something wrong. And and the thing is, is that, you know, you can be at the forefront, you can be the biggest podcast or the biggest YouTube channel or whatever, and still not have any idea of where to, you can still work yourself into a goddamn rut. And I think creatively, if you're trying to push the envelope, you're trying to push yourself, you're trying to push your audience. That's what we do. I'm, I, maybe, maybe I'm... I'm projecting a little bit on PewDiePie because the, I'm speaking to my own creative process here. I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to fuck with this audience. I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to make them react to shit. And I don't, I don't necessarily genuinely mean absolutely everything that I say uh, every time that I say it. The, the Awada joke was a great example of that. I don't give a shit about Awada either way. But again, we went back to it on this show right here. Because it, 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 do, you, do you guys really care? Do all of you people who put up the fucking Facebook death announcement, do you guys really care? No, I was just being fucking honest. I was just saying the shit that, that maybe some other people wanted to say, but felt that they couldn't and that is also compelling as a character point that's also compelling as a character construction to be the guy that goes out and says things that other people think but they feel they can't say jim jeffries is a wonderful example of this he's a guy who even says on stage look i'm a I, my entire career is being able to say really awful shit and still come off as charming yeah you know like uh, we when we apply different standards to different entertainers just based on whatever their medium is i think that that's not fair i think the key thing you just said there nate that you constantly try to push the envelope one of the major critiques i've been seeing around all these different articles is how inconsistent pewdiepie's character is and that's why people didn't immediately recognize this as a bit or as a joke going back to how uh, norris was talking about context earlier and how the context of your audience matters that does matter if he's never made a death to jews joke before this is going to come off like whoa what right. the fuck is suddenly happening here and that is important yeah Point blank period, man. So it, people can make whatever it is that they want to make, and that's fine. And you were talking about how you know other comics and, and content creators in the past have said, "Hey, I've been, I've created my entire career off being an asshole, and I'm still here." Well, you know what? You might have took. 15 10 20 years to craft this amazing asshole character that you can somehow create some sort of nuance to your shit and pewdiepie may have been trying this but he failed is pewdiepie going anywhere no so the fact that we're even talking about it in the context is if all of a sudden his career is over no is no it's nuts. not it's not it's, it's clearly it's not. nuts so you know, when you brought up, you know, he needs to be afforded the right to fail. Guess what? This was a big fail. And mm -hmm. he's going to get another shot because he's too popular to not have a shot. Yeah. Whether I agree with that or not, my opinion on that doesn't matter because I'm not paying him. So he's going to get another shot. 
everybody's gonna move on from this and then maybe we can convert our hatred or our vitriol towards something like this to somebody's yeah. substance. Uh, well, let's, then, I, I, let's, I think, then let's stop reacting like we've done some kind of justice here by, you know, uh, outing him as uh, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, uh, the fact that he's even mentioned in the same breath as Milo is ugh, fucking ridiculous. It's completely yeah. stupid. Let's, I don't even want to belabor that, man. That's a waste of breath. Oh, man. That was a good discussion. Yeah. We're 10 minutes over our time. Are we, Nika? Are yeah. we? Well, I'm glad you're keeping track, Nick. At least you've contributed something today. Okay, not like you've talked very much either. Um, first of all, I'm behind Nate. <laughs> like, I've made eye contact with Norris. Like, he's like, all right, you're next. But then and Nate just keeps I'm going. I'm sitting there trying to give him signals, and yeah, Nate is just yeah. like... <laughs> it's all right. I said all my okay. piece last week, Nika. Where were you? Exactly. Yeah. Thank I'm you. having Thank fun. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. No, you're welcome. Fat you're welcome what about too. you? Oh, I just like burning juice. He didn't say a thing the entire time. Yeah. I stand with PewDiePie, gas the juice, <laughs> burn them, <laughs> stick them in a stew. We're good. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. And you know what? We are not going to get a front page on the Wall Street Journal for that. Definitely not. And you know what? <laughs> that came from his We're heart. We're not even going to get a Twitch ban for that. That came from his heart, because I know the man. <laughs> Yeah, now oh now, now you're going to have to produce a Jewish friend to be able to get you out of this. Yeah, you do know that. Right? And I don't think you're, we have token, any. This token is this Jewish is friend? this yeah. is the racism play, playbook 101. You get accused of racism and so to be able to deflect that, you say this is my Jewish friend. Oh, look at that, the race car. And I just say that I want to burn the Jews and just not have any repercussions. <laughs> no. We fired you like 20 minutes ago. Oh yeah, that's what you I know. Actually, we kind of have insulated ourselves from that one. Yeah. He's not a representative of this show right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! See, anything could be funny. Oh my god! Oh man, this is no. This has definitely well, been a been a fun discussion. Definitely. Uh, uh, thank you, Hartslot, for calling in and uh, chiming in on the discussion. Uh, and uh, thank everyone for their comments on uh, on this last week. This has been fun to revisit, specifically because last week I didn't get a whole lot of people disagreeing with. Me. Oh, because we agreed on a whole lot of. This yeah, thing. we did. We did. Uh, so uh, I think that this has definitely been a little bit more interesting to uh, to to. Uh, but but know. but I thought yeah. I was fired for having a, a nice level-headed you conversation. Are, you we are, firing, fired. are we no. firing Norris now? For no him? no no, you no. weren't fired, Nika. You just got a timeout for an episode, and oh, we can't sorry. fire Norris because he's, he's not actually part of the show. He's a guest today. That's true. But does he is he allowed back? Yeah, of so that is, I'm allowed that is back. Um, of course. contradictory and sexist. You know who's not allowed <laughs> back? You know who's not allowed back? Fat Callie. Callie. None of them. <laughs> Cali. It's now the Nate, Robbie, and Norris show. That's right. Let's do it. Ha! Wait, we have one of those already. Yeah, we do. It's but that still has Cali on it. Well, fine. We'll fire him off that, too. <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it. Uh, we've got a couple of emails here, but uh, we're already over time, so we're going to wrap it up. Remember, coming up next at 4 p.m. is Limit Break Radio. Stay tuned here live at twitch.tv slash Limit Break Radio. FinalEncounterCast.com is our website. You can check out a full archive of our show over there, including part one of this discussion that happened last week on episode number 53. I want to thank my crew, Kooky Persona, who has been uh, answering our phone lines, as well as my in-studio crew, Robbie and Nos for Fatu. Norris for being our special guest this week, and Nika, of course, for uh, being online over our new software, Zoom. Thank you guys for tuning in. My name's Nate. Have a good one. Final Encountercast is a production of FinalEncounterCast.com, Limit Break Radio, and Bender Media Productions. Today's episode was produced by Nate Bender, Callie Sloan, and Kooky Persona. This show is made possible by the generous Patreon donors of the podcast, Limit Break Radio. Opening music provided by Keyboard Kid. More info and music can be found at KeyboardKid206.Bandcamp.com. Closing music provided by Sobzy. For more info, visit Sobzy.Bandcamp.com. For links to articles mentioned on this show, check out our live blog at FinalEncounterCast.com. Final Encountercast and its hosts are solely responsible for its content.